Um, my original uh, speaker has canceled on me, so tentatively at this point we have Susan Weaver, the interim director from the Museum of uh, Ceramics from East Liverpool, uh, coming uh, for our July meeting. August is our picnic, so we'll be hosting the picnic out at Centennial Park in Pavilion 1, which of course will bring everybody, ask everybody to bring a covered dish, and a representative from Salem Parks will be giving us an update on the Salem Park uh, system on, in August. Uh, but more importantly, uh, tonight's uh, speaker, and I'll be reading here for a minute, uh, is Megan Pellegrino. Uh, Megan joined Walsh University in 2008 and currently serves as the Museum Studies Academic Coordinator and Curator of the historical, uh, Hoover Historical Center. Her degree includes an MAT in Integrated Social Studies Education and a BA in History. Both degrees are from Miami University. Uh, her graduate work focused on representations of women in high school history textbooks. She's also a member of the nation's oldest and most prestigious honor society, Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, Megan has uh, presented webinars, conference sessions for the Ohio Museums Association, Ohio Local History Alliance, Ohio History Connection, and Association for Women in Communications. Uh, in 2015, she earned Best Community Partnership Award um, of Recognition by the Ohio Museums Association for planning and coordinating the British War Children's 75th Anniversary Commemorative Series. Uh, the series was also honored uh, with Ohio Local History Association's Award for Excellence in History Outreach. But tonight, uh, she'll be presenting the program that's entitled uh, From Horse Collars to Vacuums, A History of the Hoover, Hoover Company and Its Lasting Legacy in North Canton, Ohio. So I will let Megan tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you. How's that sound? Better. Good. Good. Okay, so, um, you know, I was thinking a lot about tonight and how, you know, many towns are sort of founded and made bigger by the companies that are part of them. And that certainly is the case in North Canton. Um, most people, you know, it's funny, third graders this year, they're the first um, kids who did not have the Hoover Company ever in North Canton. So I always go in and I talk to third graders because they study local history. And this was the first year they had never been alive when the Hoover Company was in North Canton, which is just kind of mind blowing because the Hoover Company was in North Canton, I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit, but for over a hundred years. So it really built the town, you know, you've heard, maybe you've heard the phrase, you know, company towns. That is what North Canton was, it was a company town that you know existed almost existed because of the Hoover Company mm -hmm. and you know the Hoover Company built so many things um, in the community and they even built houses this is one thing we're kind of working on right now there are streets that were built by the Hoover Company all the houses on them um, to be sold just above cost to employees so I mean it truly North Canton is there because of the Hoover Company um, so it now it becomes our job at the museum sort of becomes teaching that history to a generation that grew up without knowing it as a part of the you know the fabric of the community so I am happy to be here and um, share with all of you a little bit of the history and you know I passed out information on our tours I hope all of you come. Tours are free. They're guided tours, um, March through October, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday afternoon. So if, if you find this interesting, and I hope you do, come on over and you can actually see the house um, where kind of it all started. So okay, there we go. Let's. I want to show you a few things that would not exist in North Canton if it weren't for the Hoover Company. So this is our YMCA. And it was built, paid for and built by the founder of the Hoover Company. Um, and it still is a huge hub. I think they have 10,000 members. It's, it's a great YMCA. Um, our local library was started in that community building. And then when it moved off site and kind of made its own building, it was the daughter of the founder who sort of funded it. If you walk in there, I always tell kids when I talk about it, I'm like, have you ever, when you walk in the library, did you see that portrait of the woman? And they're all like, yes. I'm like, that's her. And then they all 
are excited. Oh, they know her. <laughs> our Price Park, same woman who was the founder's daughter. Our local high school stadium, it's actually called Memorial Stadium, and it was built in memorial to um, all of the boys who went to serve in the military um, during World War I and World War II. Mm -hmm. That was a, sort of a fun drive driven by the Hoover family members. And then, of course, there's our, our headquarters, what used to be um, the worldwide headquarters of the Hoover Company. So the site that this building sits is the location of the Hoover Company since 1870. And it was no longer affiliated with the company in 2007. So that is a long time, from 1870 to 2007. If you've ever been to North Canton, this is exactly in the middle of our downtown. So there's the Hoover Company there, our city halls across the street, that library um, is right next to it. Right next to the company is that YMCA. And in fact, it, it wasn't until the company left in 2007 that the YMCA had to supply their own heat. Their heat was actually pumped underground from the factory um, to the YMCA. So it, you know, there are just so many landmarks in North Camp that are there because of the company. Now, a lot of people wonder what's happening to this, this building now that they've left. And I have been in it. This is one of the fun parts of my job is that, you know, people contact you and, you know, tell you about their Hoover items, right? Um, in fact, I'm just working with somebody right now in Australia who wants to ship me um, a vacuum from 1978. I've had people from Turkey, somebody from, I mean, our last accessions committee where we accepted new donations, we had donors from, I think, five other states. So, I mean, this is a global company, and it's, it's so well known. It's still one of the, the most easily recognizable brands in the world. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's in our it's in our backyard. So what is happening now is that um, there was over a million square feet of space in the headquarters. What you see there, that brick building, that was actually factory space um, where a lot of, you know, the vacuums and different products were produced. There is so many other, there are, are buildings behind it and buildings to the side of it. Um, the headquarters are, are right behind it um, in what they call the International Building that was built in the 1970s. And that building um, filled very quickly. A developer bought the entire sort of parcel and they rent out um, a lot of the space to businesses. So there's, I believe, close to a thousand people working in the buildings again. Which is great because obviously when the company left, I think they took about 3,500 jobs with them. So that was a huge blow to the local economy, but you know, with the development, they're bringing some of those jobs back. This, this part of the building, the brick part, is being renovated into apartments. So on the second and third floor, there are going to be um, two and three, I believe, one and two bedroom apartments. The first floor, the plan is that for it to be retail space and restaurants. That's the word. It looks as if there is some movement being made in it, but um, I did get to go. I was telling you one of the fun parts of the job is that they, the construction workers broke into a giant safe about a year ago, and I, it's probably the size of half of this room was behind the safe. And who knows what it was filled with right when they broke into it but, but by the time I got there it was filled with um, accounting ledger books from 1910 all the way to like 2006 so drug as many of those as I could out and put them in my minivan and took them over to the museum um, but it's, it is interesting I'm hoping the development does keep moving because nobody wants to see sort of a derelict building in the middle of our downtown so we're all very hopeful okay so that's kind of the end of the story. Let's go to the beginning. Okay, so this is the man who started it all. This is William H. Hoover. Um, he was known lovingly as Boss, um, just kind of the nickname that stuck around um, because he was the boss. Uh, he, William was the oldest of three boys. His father was a farmer. And that house that you see there is actually the Hoover Historical Center. 
and that was the house that Boss grew up in. That is his parents' home. And they were farmers, but they were farmers who knew how to tan leather. And that becomes part of the story because when, um, and I'll show you, there's Boss when he's younger and the house when it was younger, <laughs> but looking very, very similar. So Boss, um, he was the oldest of three boys. He actually went to Mount Union. And when he returned from Mount Union, he um, wanted to take the family's knowledge of tanning or making leather and turn it into a business. And his, his thought was that, you know, you could sell leather. Lots of companies made leather and sold it. He thought there's more money, more profit to be made in producing leather products for sale. So that is what he did. And in the exact same location as the factory sits today is where he started his tanning business. So what did they sell? Does anybody know? Wait, you know, because he saw the title. Never mind. <laughs> they made horse collars. <laughs> okay, so I don't know how many people know what a horse collar is. Okay, but a lot of kids don't know what a horse collar is. And um, so I showed that diagram there uh, to kind of demonstrate what a horse collar is. And, you know, the horse collar is, this is an actual reproduction of a catalog page from the company in the 1870s. The horse collar is on the bottom. On top is actually a leather saddle, but it's not a saddle you sit on. It's a saddle you would kind of hook things to. So it's still draped over the horse, but you could hang things from it. So this is the 1870s, 1880s. Lots of people use horse collars. It was a great product to make because, you know, there's not, there were automobiles kind of coming on the scene, but they weren't easily affordable. Um, most people, certainly if you were a farmer, you were using horse horses to kind of help you farm. And then also just transportation. So this, horse collars were products that, that people needed. And they definitely had a market for this product. and. You know, the claim of the company was that there were lots of horse collars on the market, but theirs was a quality, high quality horse collar. They um, were very much, you know, told people about the fact that theirs was oak chip leather, um, so it was tanned with oak chips. Um, that the, the straw, kind of the stuffing inside of the collar was longer, so it wouldn't hurt the horse. Um, and they actually named it, one of, one of the models was called the Perfection. So, I mean, with a name like that, it had to sell, right? <laughs> okay, so how it is used is the horse collar goes over the neck of the horse, and what it does is it distributes weight um, from pulling. So you can see something is hooked up to the horse collar there, maybe a carriage or farming um, implement. And the horse can pull it and it distributes the weight across its chest and shoulders so that it's, it's more comfortable for the horse. So that was our product and Boss um, was very successful at selling it not just in you know, Northeast Ohio, throughout the whole state. He was selling into other neighboring states um, and doing very well. In 1905 there were 200 employees at the company and only 300 people lived in New Berlin. So it was New Berlin, World War I comes, we changed our name to North Canton, which was also a push from the company who had a government contract and didn't want to be selling things from New Berlin. Um, so it, right from the beginning it was, it was successful. It was very successful. So everybody always wonders, how do we go from this? to vacuums because that's what everybody knows um, the company for. But let me show you just before I get into that a little bit more um, pictures. These are actually pictures from the factory when it was making leather products. So I believe, um, I know for a fact that the large picture is from the 1880s and that's showing inside the factory it was different buildings then. In fact, you can see what the buildings looked like on the smaller pictures. They were wooden framed buildings in the same location, but different buildings. And that's those are pictures. The big one is of um, the men working on the leather straps. You can see them hanging from the ceiling. 
And then the other two pictures are employees outside of the buildings. And you can see, hopefully, a stack of the horse collars down there on the bottom right. Okay, so we knew it was coming. There's a problem. The problem is the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> so when automobiles become easily accessible to the average person, people need many fewer horse collars. So, you know, at first they were called um, horseless carriages. And the horseless carriage just really did a number on the Hoover Company. But they quickly um, diversified what they were making. Um, the Ford Motor Company was incorporated in 1903. And the Hoover Company knew that they had to make other products. So they actually started making products for early automobiles. So they made the you know leather steering wheel covers. They made the leather cushions, license plate straps. And my favorite is that they produced a shock absorber. A what? A shock absorber. So they they actually manufactured the metal part of it as well. But it, the funny part is there was a leather strap that held the shock absorber together. Um, they also made some sporting goods, canvas clothing, and leather kind of sporting goods um, items. But they really um, needed to go a little bit further. And that is when this man comes into the picture. Okay, so. Has anybody in here ever heard of James Murray Spangler? Okay, he's a really important person in this story because he um, he was from Canton and he was an inventor. He had actually patented a couple of um, farming implements earlier um, in the 1800s, but not very successfully um, manufacturing and selling anything. So he was working as a janitor in a department store in downtown Canton. And one of the kind of bad parts about that job for him was that he had asthma, so sweeping the floors at the end of the night, and you can imagine how dirty floors would be when you have dirt roads and, and all of that, would, it would make it hard for him to breathe. So he invented this. He invented an electric vacuum. And he got it patented. And so when I talk to kids, I always say, who watches Shark Tank? Okay, so if you've seen the show Shark Tank, they always ask, do you have a patent? Because if you have the patent, nobody else can manufacture it without your permission or without paying you royalties. Um, so having that patent was really important. And um, he was granted the patent, and less than two months later, he sold it to the Hoover Company. So he had tried to manufacture and sell them himself, but, I mean, it was taking him a week to manufacture one vacuum. It was a one-man show, so he's trying to manufacture them, he's trying to sell them, and doing neither of those things very well. Um, sort of local lore is that he was cousins with Boss's wife. We're not sure if that's true, you know, how these, these things, <coughs> we're not sure. Perhaps they were um, related by marriage. But um, regardless, he knew that Boss was a very good businessman. So there was a meeting between James Murray Spangler, Boss, and Boss's two eldest sons. And they worked out a deal, and the Hoover Company bought the rights and the patent for the electric vacuum you see there. Okay, so that was in August, um, our birthday, is August 8th, um, 1908. So they bought it and it was very success successful. And I want to show you why it was so success successful. Um, like I said, I keep mentioning it was electric. So only 10% of homes at this time had electricity. Um, so you've you're got a small market there, but that tends to be a wealthy market. Um, so here's what you could use if you didn't have one of these vacuums. So thousands, I, I really think this part is really interesting. For literally thousands of years, this was all you had to clean your floors. 
And then, you know, even this, you know what a carpet feeder is or a rug paddle? Even that didn't come around until like the 1840s, 1850s. So that one is, I could have brought, you see these at antique shows, flea markets all the time. They tend to be made out of metal with a wooden handle. They look like something you might want to pick up if your kids are being bad. <laughs> but you, you have to take, you have to move all your furniture, take your rug outside, and then just beat it with the carpet beater. Shake the dust off. I hear somebody over there has knows somebody with a collection. They're very collectible, so you see them in. You have one too. Yes. Yes. All nice. Um, we have quite a collection too at the museum. <laughs> okay, and then I want to show you some of the other vacuums, and these are pictures from the museum. We have a whole room filled with what we call manual vacuums. So they are vacuums that do not use electricity. And all of these really, you know, goes along with the Industrial Revolution. So 1850s, this is a Bissell. So Bissell is still a family-owned um, company from Michigan. Um, this was made in the 1850s. And actually, it should look somewhat familiar to you because it is the same concept as what you see in restaurants. You know, you push it, it spins a carpet, a brush roll, and kicks the dirt up into a container in the back. So Bissell made that in the 1850s. You can see it also, it's in that the same picture. Um, the one though that I'm highlighting on the right, that is called the Whirlwind. And the Whirlwind is really important. It's from 1869. And this is the first vacuum that introduces suction. Hence, you know, Whirlwind, because it used a fan. And can you see that circular part? There's, there are fan blades inside of there, and then up at the top, you have to go like this. And it turns a cord that turns the fan blades. So suction is created from this fan that you are turning manually, and it sucks up the dirt. Now, there become then all sorts of different plays on creating suction. This, this one actually was granted a patent as well, and it, this one cracks me up because she has shoes that are bellows on her knee. Oh. And as she walks, it's creating suction. So we have, like I said, it's, it's a really neat room in the museum because you see all these different ideas of how to create suction. This one, this is one of um, the students in the Walsh Museum Studies program. Um, we are very lucky that we have a museum studies program. And every student who's a minor or a major in museum studies they spend a semester at the museum, and they learn the tour, and they do research and um, different things, write articles for our newsletter. So she is demonstrating um, the cotton. And the cotton is actually from 1910. So it's actually after the first Hoover model comes out. And the way you power it is it kind of looks like a skateboard. But under the skateboard, there are two bellows. And you have to rock back and forth really fast. <coughs> to create the suction. And then she's holding the nozzle and the hose. And this one cracks me up because you can only vacuum like in a little circle around yourself. <laughs> and then you're gonna to have to pick that whole thing up and like move it to the next circle and and it's it's a workout. And so this one, if you come to the museum, you can actually use this one, um, which is always fun. So this is what is contemporary to that first Hoover vacuum. And this is what the first Hoover vacuum looked like. Um, we call it the Model O, the company called it the Model O. Um, it weighed 40 pounds, which seems like a lot now, but um, its only other sort of competitor at the time weighed 90, oh. and you actually had to push it, it was low to the ground and you were trying to push it across. Um, so that company didn't do very well. And it was also unfortunate for them that they were in San Francisco, which had a big fire, and that was the end of that company. But the Hoover is the first, we call it the first successful electric vacuum cleaner. And I'll just point out, because it's one of my favorite little tidbits, but can you see the plug? Can you see the end of the plug in that close-up? It kind of looks like um, a spark plug. So it actually, what it really is, is it's the end of a light bulb because you would have to unscrew your light bulb from your ceiling and screw your vacuum in up there. 
<laughs> and those, that is what every plug looked like until a model that came out in 1926. And I've heard, maybe somebody in here knows, I've heard two different theories. One was that when houses were kind of wired for the first time, they only brought them to ceiling lights. The other one, so I don't know what the, the correct answer to this is, but the other one was that wall plugs were charged at a higher rate. You had to pay more to use the electricity from the wall. So I think it's one of those. <laughs> if anybody knows, you can let me know. Okay, so the Hoover Company just does phenomenally well. Um, by 1919, they already had a factory in Canada and they sold over 100,000 vacuums. And that's right after World War I, where, you know, the country wasn't going and buying a lot of vacuums. But they did very well. Um, this picture, this sort of diagram that you see here, is are all of the factories around the world. And you can't see it very well, I'm sure, but they that's North Canton right in the middle, the big one. And then in the upper right was in just outside of London, there was another sort of European headquarters. It was the Hoover Limited. That um, is up there. There's France, Brazil, Sweden, Wales. I mean, they are all over the world. And here, just a few years later, was the product line. So it's kind of fun to pick out in here the products that they made because obviously it wasn't just vacuums. <laughs> so you can see um, by the model, the lovely model, um, there is there are several varieties of hair dryers, and um, I like those the things that look like suitcases in the bottom left. Mm -hmm. Those are vacuums um, that you open up. They're kind of uh -huh. I, I think my in-laws have one of those. Um, that model was actually displayed in the Louvre um, in the 1960s. There was a competition for like industrial design, so sort of beautiful design, and only 300 companies had items selected, and the Hoover Company had an item displayed in the Louvre. There's fry pans. A lot of people still have their Hoover fry pans. Toasters, blenders, electric knives, electric toothbrushes, um, you know, the washers up above. We have a twin tub. Um, do you see those little, little machines to the left of the washing machines? Those are called twin tubs, and what they are is they're on wheels, and so if you lived in an apartment, you push it to your sink, you hook um, your faucet, you take this thing and hook it up to the faucet, and it does a load of laundry in four minutes, and then you pop it into the other side, and that's the part that's open. You put it in there, and you push that lid down, and it spins it, so it kind of spins a lot of water out. Mm -hmm. um, we, the one that we have on display, somebody brought from St. Louis. They rented a U-Haul and brought it up to us um, because it was their, they just associated it with their great aunt who had passed, and they didn't want to get rid of it, so. They brought it up to us, and we have it on display. Okay. So, you know, we all know, we, I started kind of on the bad note in that the Hoover Company left um, North Canton in 2007. But the good news is that you can still buy a Hoover vacuum. So it's a sort of a long, convoluted story, but... Um, in 1985, the family decided to sell. Um, now, they, it was a public company, but they held a lot of the stock. And so the family decided to sell at that point, and a holding company um, buys it and sells it to Maytag. So Maytag is who owned the company for from 1989 to about 2004. And then they sold it to Whirlpool, and then Whirlpool sold it to TTI. So TTI is Tektronic Industries, and they're based in Hong Kong, but they have a North American um, floor care division, and Hoover is one of their brands, and they also have some, a couple of other brands, and I, I never want to get it wrong, but I think Dirt Devil is a brand that they own. They also own Ryobi um, Power Tools. 
but they really they seem to care a lot about the history of the company. They bring um, new higher level um, hires to the museum, and um, they go through and they've had meetings. The president of Hoover has come and held meetings with all of his top people. They've come to the museum so that they get they really want to know a lot about the history. So I think that's great, and I think the fact that you know. Over a hundred years after you know the first Hoover vacuum was made in North Canton, you can still buy a Hoover vacuum. So that one, I just pulled that off their website today. That is their one of their newer models. Um, it looks like it's the pet model. So I'm guessing the cat knocked over the flowers, and there's the Hoover picking it up. Okay, so I have a couple more slides, but this one is interactive. And this is another really neat kind of part of the history. So I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are men spelling out Hoover. And these men are international salesmen. They're the top salesmen. So if you were one of the top salesmen, and it, you could be at that time, this is in the 1920s, it would be Canada, United States, and England. If you're one of the top salesmen, you were privileged enough to come camp out in North Canton um, at Hoover Park. In Hoover Park, you can still go there today. It's right behind the museum. Um, and that is where all the salesmen would, would sleep in their tents. You see their tents back there? And then um, some of the buildings that they used are still standing. Um, the banquet hall where they would have their meals is, is still there. And a lot of people, barn weddings are big now. And this... It's kind of a, it's an open air, big wooden timber building. Um, so that's still there. But one of the things they would do, they would come into North Canton and they would have these parades where all the townspeople would come out and there were these parades and it'd be like, this is, you know, the Division 13's float. And so there's guys, salesmen from, I don't know, Illinois or something and they have their float. Everybody's standing outside and there was a calliope that still exists, that sometimes gets pulled out for events. Um, but they also had their own song book. So they would learn, it was kind of, um, I think they were there for two weeks, they would get tours of the factory, and they would learn about new products and kind of sales techniques, but it was also sort of camaraderie. And so this is one of their songs, and this became the Big Hoover song. It's all the dirt, all the grit. So I want to play it for you. This is a recording of, um, the men in the 1920s <laughs> So I don't know, let me see. Should I try and turn the microphone on here? Oh, you know it. You know it. <laughs> Did you work at Hoover? No, but I wish I would have. <laughs> OK, a lot of people still know this song. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do, the words are right here. I don't think this. It's on. Is it on? Oh, it was. I see a light. No. I did kind of flip the switch a couple times. Let's see. Oh, there it is. There it is. No, it's, it's finicky. It's pretty loud, so I think you'll hear it no matter what. Okay, so I'm going to play it twice. The first time, you can just follow along the words. And then my challenge to you is that the second time, <laughs> I want you to sing along. So you'll recognize the tune, okay? And let's see. I'll hold it up. It's still kind of old fashioned. We still use a tape recorder. <laughs> Okay. So we'll just listen to it the first time. Thank you. 
carpets mm -hmm. and only Hoover got all three types of dirt okay and the whole it beats as it sweeps as it cleans is that um, they they said that the the brush roll would lightly beat the carpet so as it's brushing it's kind of beating it and that those kind of vibrations are making the dirt pop up and it sweeps it so it beats as it sweeps as it cleans becomes kind of a big sort of salesman tagline. They, their, the salesman publication was called the Ibasiac after the It Beats As a Sweet as It Cleans. Okay. And then, just because I love this part of history and I had to throw it in for you. Oh, there it is. Hopefully I didn't push too many times. Okay. So I wanted, I, I don't normally really have time to get into this, but if you had give me five minutes, I'll tell you just briefly about sort of the company's um, involvement and sort of what they did during World War I and World War II. So on the left, the left side is kind of my World War I items. And we are 2017, I, it doesn't seem to be as big of a deal as, as the, um, you know, Civil War's 150th anniversary, but 2017 is the 100th anniversary of the United States entering World War I. Mm -hmm. So when the United States entered World War I, obviously there were people from New, Ber New Berlin, or, you know, it was New Berlin at the break of the war, um, and from the Hoover Company who left um, to go fight in the war. <laughs> so Boss, um, down there, that is a picture of Boss at this time, he wanted to keep um, the boys who went off to fight in the war kind of knowing what was going on in New Berlin. So he started um, a publication called the Newsy News. <laughs> and the organization was the Our Laddies Welfare Association. So the OWLA, or OLWA that you see up there. So it was this publication um, that they then sent to the different training camps throughout the United States. Um, and it had just all this funny little tidbits of life in New Berlin. And so it would be like, you know, a young lady from New Berlin was seen in Canton at Benders with a young man from Canton. And, you know, things like that. And, you know, we got a new street light. And it would talk about what's going on in the, the factory and at the company as well. So the first issues were just hand typed, and they just typed enough to send them to the training camps. But then everybody kind of wanted one. It became like the town newspaper. So they started <coughs> publishing, I think, a couple thousand issues of it, and then everybody in the community would get one as well. And what's really neat about them is that Boss's oldest son, he liked photography, so he would take pictures, and they would actually glue photographs into these issues. Um, so right now at the museum we have a display because this is the 100th anniversary of the war and also the Newsy News. Um, we have a display in the different rooms that show sections and little cuttings of, and we didn't actually cut them, they're digital copies, um, of Newsy News issues. And that publication later became called the Hoover News and its last issue was published in 2005. 
So we have we have all of we have originals of all of them. And so if you come to the museum, I have one of the very first ones laying out for people to see. Mm -hmm. But it's just this really great way to kind of learn the history of North Canton and the company. Okay, so on the right, this is my World War II portion. And you see, do you see the newsy news there? So that was the newsy news continued, and during World War II, its kind of purpose was the same. So they would publish pictures of boys that were leaving to fight in the war. They would, um, if the soldiers wrote back, they would publish their letters. Um, it also was very informative for the employees of the company on um, what the company was doing because they stopped producing vacuums. Um, there was an order. They had to stop producing vacuums and sort of retool and start making wartime um, products that the government needed. And one of the most important items that they made were fuses. So you can see that one there. That is the 10 millionth fuse that the company made, and I believe that was in 1943. So they made millions and millions of fuses. And one of their major projects was working on a proximity fuse. And I was never interested in fuses until I started working there. <laughs> um, but a proximity fuse is really interesting. It's a very major engineering um, accomplishment. And a fuse, what the fuse does is it's what ignites a bomb. It's what detonates it. And most fuses detonate on impact. So like the one you see there, that is a kind of a regular fuse. So when it hits the ground, the bomb goes off. But a proximity fuse, actually has a radio inside of it and it emits radio frequency and when it detects that it's so close to an object it detonates and that could be in the air so you could actually shoot it in the air and it would when it got close to a plane it would detonate so the Hoover company made the battery and their engineers are the ones who created and figured out how to power the battery because you don't want those radio waves going off until it's been shot out because it's going to be in close proximity to something. Yeah. So it was a big um, sort of achievement. And they said it, the government said that it was the second most secret <coughs> munitions project during World War II. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the first being the nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. um, so the company was awarded just every award the government could give. Um, they were awarded for selling bonds and for signing up like a huge percentage of the employees that they were automatically getting payroll deductions to buy bonds. They also, that Army Navy E that you see, that banner, that was, um, the E is for excellence in production. And the Hoover Company was awarded that five times. And the most any company in the United States received it were, was six times. And then I could talk to you for hours <laughs> about the group of children at the bottom there. So, you might have heard um, when you were introducing me, I talked about the um, British war children. So because, remember I said that they had another headquarters outside of London? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, England was involved in the war before we joined. And so they were very concerned. As soon as Germany occupied France, they were very concerned that German forces would come into England or, you know, drop bombs. So they knew the Blitz was coming. And um, so H.W. Hoover, he was boss's son. He was president of the company. He made an offer to any employee that worked for Hoover Limited in England, Scotland, or Wales that if they wanted to send their children to North Canton, we would take them in. And 84 children were sent across the Atlantic Ocean in 1940. And they lived here for five years. They did not return until the end of the war. Some of the older kids did have to go back and actually serve in the military when they got to be a certain age. But um, most of those kids were in Stark County for five years. And they, they came and they were, the, those are them, the ones in the bottom, they're like five and six year old children. Then they ranged up to 15. So you can imagine if you're a five year old, first of all, you're being sent to a place you've never been and you're living with a family that you don't know, um, but they were here until, you know, they were 10, or if they came when they were, you know, 12. I mean, these, this is, these are huge years in a child's life. Um, so there are some really great history and stories about 
the five years that the children were here. But it was a remarkable effort to keep the children safe. So that is all I have to share. Yes. I'm just curious. I remember my mom's Hoover, you know, way back in the yeah. late fifties, early sixties. Uh -huh. Had a headlight. Was Hoover the first one to have the headlight? Yes. Hoover year? designed the headlight in 1932. Mm -hmm. So yes, and, and you think about it, those early ones where you had to unplug your your light. Yeah. I guess you had to vacuum during the daytime because there's no light. <laughs> so in 1932, they created the headlight, which was a light. And at first it was an attachment that you could add to older models, but then the next model they came out with had it included in it. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Now this new company that's taken over, are they, are they also making this, I don't know what you call it, but it's a remote control thing you can set it down and it lines know, itself all over? I don't think so. Um, you're kind of like a Roomba, yeah, one of those. Um, yeah. Not Friends that I know of. Not that I know of, but they, one thing that I'm very happy about with the new company is that they have moved, they brought some manufacturing back to the United States. So there was no, there were no, after they left North Canton, there was a time period that there were no Hoovers being manufactured in the United States. They brought all of their commercial vacuum production back to the United States. They're in Tennessee. And I think even some of their um, residential vacuums are being made in the United States. So. That's good, but I don't think they have one of those kind of robot ones yet. All right. But there is a model. My favorite model is a Hoover Constellation. If you come to the museum, you can actually play with one because it floats on air. It hovers. So I don't know if anybody had one. It came out in 1955. It didn't start. It didn't start floating until 1956 model. Um, but it's it's kind of a big. Almost looks like a planet. It's round, and the exhaust comes out the bottom, and so you walk, and it just follows you. I mean, you can touch it with a pinky, and it flies across the room. Yeah. Mm. Hovercraft. So, like but when you start out, it blows all the dirt. That one of the flaws. One of the flaws was that you could not use it on hard surfaces because it would. All your dust bunnies are going to fly. It was just for carpet. Yes. I have three money questions. How much um, did Spangler sell the uh, patent for? <laughs> okay. We, to give you an answer, the answer is going to be I don't know. <laughs> but the reason is, you know, the museum was started and run by the company as part of like public relations from 1978 until 2004. And they didn't really like money things being out there. So I don't know, but here's what I do know. Um, Spangler was kept on, and he supervised all the manufacture of the vacuums. He also filed and received a couple more patents on kind of updates on vacuums. And then his family, and he received royalties on every vacuum sold until, I think, 1925. So I can kind of answer this in that their only surviving child there was just the, the Canton Repository just did this big, like, three-part series, and they dug through, like, court records. And when Spangler's oldest daughter died in either the 60s or 70s, she had left over a million dollars in her estate. So I think they did okay. Yeah. I think they were okay. And how much did, um, you said in 1985, the uh, Maytag bought the Hoover Company? And what did Hoover sell it for? I really don't know any money. <laughs> I'm not sure. I bet I could find that out though because that would have to be in, because it was a public company, yeah. it would be in their annual reports. So I, I could answer that for you if you email me and I can give you my business card. <laughs> I'm thinking it was a lot. <laughs> Over a hundred million, I'm thinking. But I can find that answer. And then you said uh, they sold over 100,000 um, vacuum cleaners. In 1919? Yes. Mm -hmm. How much did a vacuum cleaner sell for? Okay, I don't think I ever told you what the Model O, o sold for today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Model O was $60 in 1908. And if you got the attachments, it was 75 And I believe, you know how you can go on the internet and kind of do like, 
currency calculators, I think it's over a thousand dollars in today's. So they and the price stayed around a hundred dollars between seventy and a hundred for a long time. So I'd say, yeah, I've done the calculations on what I think they made in 1919, and it was a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't really know any of them. <laughs> Darn it. Yeah. So you said the museum was formed due to public relations. Was it the kids that did that then? And was no. it all still part of the family? Okay, so in 1978, it was the 70th anniversary. So it's kind of funny because they act as if the Hoover Company did not exist until 1908, but really it was from you know 1870. But they started going by that first model O, so 1908. So in 1978, it was their 70th anniversary, and as part, they always celebrated their anniversaries really big. Um, and they opened the museum as part of their 70th anniversary. And I believe, you know, when I say it was, it was sort of public relations, that's the department that ran it. Um, so I think they saw it kind of as, as like a gift to the community, kind of, and also as sort of a repository for the company records. We just had a researcher in September who came from England, a professor of business history, and he was there, he came just to come to the museum and he spent four days just going through and he said that we have the best company archives he's ever seen and he's done research all around the world. So um, I think it was sort of PR, community relations, and a repository for the history. And the house was still part of the family at that point? So the house, um, it was his parents' house. Very soon after the company was founded and it was successful, most of the family moved right next to the factory. So we have like aerial photographs from the 1920s and like boss is right there like in the yard of the factory. His daughter, his brother, his mom and dad, his son, they're all right there. And it's only one mile up the road from where the house is, the museum is. Um, but I believe it stayed in the family for a while and they kind of rented it out. Um, we, there was a, a woman who was 101 years old and she was born in the house. Her parents rented it from the Hoovers. But then I think um, most of the sort of family properties became owned by the company. So I, the company owned it in 78. I'm sorry? Why did Walsh University? Why did Walsh get it? Okay. So, 2004, and actually, it goes even a little bit further back. So the house is actually not in the exact location it used to be. Um, has any is anybody familiar with the museum? I know a couple people in here have been there. Okay, so it is right kind of across Maple Street from Walsh University. Now there is a big um, giant eagle, Starbucks, Sonic, big sort of commercial development right on the corner of Maple and Market Avenue. The house used to be right about where Starbucks is. <laughs> so Maytag started liquidating things from the company and they wanted to sell that corner lot. So the house and two large barns were moved further towards town just a little bit. It was all still family property. And like the camp where the um, you know the salesman camp that none of that moved. So we just they just moved the houses a little bit closer so they could sell off that property. So that they moved the house in 1997, 1998 over the winter. And there's a fun story about them like dropping it. So they I don't know why they didn't move it on the road. They moved it through the fields. And it like Broke, yeah. We got a new roof out of it, apparently. <laughs> um, yes, but then they donated it in 2004 when they were also selling and donating other properties all throughout town. So, like, there's so many spots that were donated from the company just bought up <coughs> tons of property through all the years. So they donated it. But they have to keep the museum open. I don't know who they donated to. Wall shooters. Oh, oh, oh. Which is great because they are are keeping it going. The museum is open, and we're not charging admission. It's part of our museum studies program curriculum, so it's really integrated very well with Walsh University. So it's been a great 
thing that that happened. When you yeah. go back to the horse collars, you had a photograph of catalog thing. Mm -hmm. Did it also have the price? I'm guessing eight, mm -hmm. ten dollars. You know, because it's eighteen seventies right after the war, and that would be. But maybe it wouldn't be that much. Why am I so terrible at money questions? <laughs> <laughs> I bet if we pull that slide back up and get something real close, we can look at it. I'll try and figure that out, but I'm not sure exactly what they sold for offhand. But I can find out. I mean, we have the catalogs at the museum. So I can also give you my business card, and you can email me, and I will look it up for you when I go into the museum. Yes. As far as the children, did any of them have here in the States, and have you had a chance to meet any of them? Yes. Yes, um, so 84 children came, all 84 children, you know, survived the war, um, but a good 10 to 15 stayed here after the war ended. Some of them because they were in college and didn't want to leave. Um, some of them, their parents moved here. Um, you know, life in England did not get back to normal until like the mid-1950s. Um, they were still rationing food into the 1950s. <coughs> And many of the children who came, they lived in London, and London was decimated um, from the Blitz. So, some of there's some fun stories like, you know, T. K. Harris. You heard of T. K. Harris? It's like a real estate architect. It's a big company in Canton, and um, T. K. Harris himself took in two boys that were brothers, and he became very attached to them. And he moved the mother here after the war, bought her house, and sent the boys to college. So um, there's another story um, of a boy who, he became a priest. He went to seminary um, in Detroit, I believe, somewhere in Michigan. And he never went back home. He just died about a year ago. Um, but he was a priest in the Youngstown Diocese. Father Platt. Um, so yeah, there were some that stayed. And yes, I have met um, several of them. One woman, she still lives very close to um, Walsh University. She was one of five siblings that came together. They were all separated into different homes. And um, she was very happy with the family here. But you know, after the war went back and worked at Hoover Limited for a couple of years and met a soldier. Oh. From Stark County, <laughs> oh, moved back here, so she still lives just up the road. Um, I have some oral histories that I've done. Um, I brought back three of them from England, and they were on a, at a panel discussion. You can find that it's really interesting. That was part of the series that we did, and that is on Vimeo. If you go on Vimeo, it's like it's like YouTube, and you put in British War Children, you can see their kind of what they remembered of it and how it affected them and it's really interesting. We and brought two things from our collection. Oh my goodness, yes. Okay, so this is the carpet beater. So this is what I, I like to bring it into the schools because the kids get a kick out of it. Yeah, you just like <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if I can't remember if you have one of these, but I let me see the name of it because I think we do have one. But it's a suction vacuum cleaner. You can see these when you go on a tour in our um, original building. So how this one? This is called a pump action. So in order for it to work, you actually have to go like this over and over and over and over and over and over. And, over. and it's. Do you mind if I pick it up? Oh no, because we use it. You can bump it. Okay. <laughs> do you see how little the actual hole yeah. where the, the dirt goes in? I just. There's no way that these things work very well. It's really hard to pump. Yeah, but. Let's see if I can get this dirt. Oh, it did get it. It did get it. Yeah. Yay. So that's a new man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Any other questions? Well, I hope you um, hope you enjoyed it. I sometimes I think you know people are kind of like vacuums, <laughs> but it's really a good way to kind of see like development in industrial design and how it's all connected to history. Um, so if you come into the museum, you just we have advertisements, products, 
photographs, original artwork that were in, that ran in ads. Because you don't think, at least I never thought, you know, before there were computers, an artist actually painted a picture that became the ad. And all the wartime products we have on display, we have a whole room about the 1940s. Um, so I hope you come. I hope you come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just help yourself to dessert and punch. Yeah, me too. Do you have any questions for me? Yes, I will be. And I forgot to tell you that our hostesses for this evening are Judy and Jan.